Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome fast board chair John Schleter and fast president Alana Newhouse. My goodness. Look around this room. I have never seen such a mass of beautiful people. Give yourselves a big round of applause. Unbelievable. Good evening, everyone. My name is John Schleter, and I am the board chair of FAST. I'm so honored to welcome everyone to FAST's 15th annual dinner. My, my thanks to all of you sitting in the room, the researchers, the doctors, the advocates, our friends in the industry. In the next decade, the next decade is poised to look very different for those living with Angelman syndrome and all their loved ones. The, In the next decade, we will be curing together Angelman Syndrome. I'm so pleased to be standing here with the newest member of our leadership team. We like to joke that she jumped right into the deep end having quite recently been diagnosed. Please help me welcome FAST new president, Alana Newhouse. Thank you so much, John. And thank you to everyone here for the warm welcome into FAST and the Angelin Syndrome community. But thank you even more deeply for everything you've all done for so many years. As John noted, due to a series of unusual circumstances, our son Elijah, who is now eight, was diagnosed with AS in March of this year. As it happens, I had actually diagnosed him when he was 18 months old off a Google search. Since March, my husband and I have had too many discussions to count about all of the years we spent palming around in the darkness, not knowing something so crucial. At first, I was frustrated and not a little angry. But one of the things I've realized is that we were diagnosed into hope, which is an unusual and incredible experience. And it's one I wouldn't have had if we were diagnosed years ago. I would love to believe that I would be the kind of person who would have had hope no matter what, who would have had hope before the science seemed promising, before research results came in with good news, before human trials started but I'm not sure I would have been that person. Thankfully, so many people in this room were. So many of you had hope before there was anything real to show for it. And that hope was the engine that then created new facts on the ground, that created a new reality for all of us. I couldn't be more grateful to everyone in this room for that. Inspired by your example, I am here to grab any, bat any baton that you want to pass me. Thank you so much for everything you've done for my little boy and for all of our loved ones. I am thrilled and honored to join you in this fight. Thank you. Thank you, Alana, and indeed, thank you to everyone in this room. Now I'd like to invite the FAST Board Secretary, Amelia Beatty, to the stage. Thank you, John. I'm so pleased to present our FAST Global Teams tonight. Many of you heard their presentations uh, yesterday during the Global Science Summit showing the community what they have accomplished and how they have contributed to the FAST Global Mission. We are so proud of the hard work that they all have accomplished 
And so I want to ask all of our FAST Global board members here tonight to stand, and all of the physicians and the clinicians and researchers that work with them as well. I will recognize each FAST Global by name, and I invite you to give them another round of applause. So first we have FAST Australia. And we have FAST UK. And FAST France. FAST Spain. Fast Canada, Fast Italy, and Fast Latin America. Thank you so much, Fast Global. Now, please welcome Fast Board members Ben O'Connor, Megan Cross, and Nora Tsu. Good evening, everyone. Cure Angelman Now, or CAN, is an opportunity for families to raise awareness for AS in their communities, as well as to raise money and funds for FAST. Many of you participated in CAN, warming our hearts to see both time-tested fundraising traditions as well as creative, extremely creative, approaches to a kick-ass party. Would all the CAN participants in attendance please stand and be recognized, in addition to those virtually who are with us who've done all that type of work. Would everyone please stand who took part in CAN? From frozy t frozen turkey bowling, which frankly I haven't heard of before, to golf tournaments, to Halloween costume parties, and simply asking for donations as birthday gifts. We recognize the countless number of hours that you've put into planning, spreading the word, and inspiring. Thank you for your support and your participation. In addition, we want to recognize some top can fundraisers. The Edberg family for William. Now they're in the room. The Beatty family for Orion. The Webb family for Harper. The Warner family for Louis. The Porio family for James. The Sargent family for Maddie. The Smith family for Sutton. The Jacobson family for Maddie. and the Cutler family joining us virtually for Charlie. Together as a community, and this is my first gala, so we were just diagnosed a couple years ago, but a community that I have come to know, good-looking community, passionate community, and powerful community. Thank you so much. Together, you've raised a total of over $950,000. All right, I think we're going to get to 
dinner. But before that, I just want to say because of you, all of our loved ones and their future are going to look incredibly different because of you. So thank you for my daughter and all of our kids. So. All right, I'm the last thing that stands between you and dinner. So please enjoy your meal. The program will resume after. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome FAST Chief Science Officer, Allison Brent, and FAST Board Member, Roy Azut. Hi, everybody. I just want to say that we are so grateful for all of the amazing people joining us tonight. Thank you all so much for being with us. Please continue to enjoy your dinner as Allison and I present some very special awards. Tonight's first award is the 2022 CureAS Discovery Award. This award is reserved for an individual that embodies FAST's mission to contribute to discovering transformative therapies to reach an ultimate cure for Angelman syndrome. Having made exemplary contributions in the field over their career, this individual is responsible for developing the most utilized AS mouse model by nearly all researchers in the field. This person is always game. He receives an email in the middle of the night with an idea by a parent who may or may not be me. It likely arrived at 3 a.m. because that's when I function best. By 8 a.m., there's a response in my inbox. I think this is a great idea. Let me think about it. Within a week, there's a proposal on my desk on how it may or may not work and, and why. It's data-driven, and there's considerations of the pros and the cons. This is someone who repeats, everything is possible, some things are just maybe less probable. This person sees AS, the AS mouse model, as a very valuable tool, but being a clinician scientist, he knows the only true model of disease are the patients themselves. This award goes to someone who is willing to take a leap and always try to think bigger. For those who do not hear his talk yesterday, you would have been mind blown. In collaboration with amazing colleagues at Yale University, this person took an idea we have been dreaming of, a potential one-and-done therapeutic that has great brain distribution and can replace UBE3A, the gene our kids are missing. He showed incredible proof of concept in the mouse that he developed over 25 years ago, in record time, and is advancing this program toward clinical trials with the support of the team at FAST. This person sees FAST as a conduit to ensure that drug development happens efficiently, safely, yet quickly. It is a great pleasure to honor a true legend with the CureAS Discovery Award. The 2022 CureAS Discovery Award goes to Dr. Yonghui Jiang. He deserves that more than you know. The next award is the 2022 CureAS Innovation Award. This award goes to an individual that has demonstrated the ability to push research boundaries on Angelman syndrome in an outstanding and innovative way, standing out amongst so many. This award goes to a person that we all know as one who will do whatever it takes to ensure that patients are the recipients of the most innovative and transformative treatments that are created. She will move mountains with regulatory agencies, if and when she can. She will speak truths about what is right, what is ethical, and what is rational. This person usually takes phone calls somewhere between 10 p.m. and 3 a.m., and if you are not able to keep up with that, you naturally feel totally inadequate. 
This person is basically the Kevin Bacon of neurodevelopmental disorders. Everyone has worked with her or tried to within seven degrees of separation, and likely less. This person is on the advisory board for every company that has ever developed or is considering developing or will develop a drug for just about any neurodevelopmental disorder on the planet. At any scientific meeting, when someone asks about endpoints for neurodevelopmental disorders, they all just say, why don't we ask Liz? We are lucky to have this person in our court fighting every day for our loved ones and willing to dance her heart out every year on this dance floor with her entire research team to celebrate the progress being made finding a treatment for Angelman syndrome. This person has the brains, the wherewithal, the fire in her belly, and the sense of humor to keep us all fighting regardless of the challenges that we all know could lie ahead. The Curious Innovation Award goes to Dr. Elizabeth Berry Kravis. Next, I'd like to present the 2022 Curious Acceleration Award. This award goes to an individual that has demonstrated the willingness and the desire to accelerate research activities through various different AS research initiatives, thinking outside the box and being nimble to change with a new vision and opportunities. This person has meticulous work ethic, has compassion for all of our loved ones beyond measure, is willing to take the guidance from her colleagues in industry sponsors, but is not afraid to push back when she vehemently disagrees on how frequently one should ever do a Bailey. It should never be done in a patient more than once every six months to a year. This individual is one of the people that has really helped us to advance the Angelman Syndrome Biomarker and Outcome Measure Consortium to a totally new level. This person was committed to get the work done we so desperately needed, and not only got it all done, but got all done on time. This person gives everyone around her credit and is so humble, she is visibly nervous to ever take credit. She takes her commitment to our amazing community so seriously, and for this, we have been able to accelerate our clinical endpoints and robustness of numerous clinical trials for those living with Angelman syndrome. It is a great honor to give the Cure AS Acceleration Award to Dr. Angel Sandiwani. And tonight's final award, this is the 2022 Cure AS Community Accelerator Award. This award goes to an AS community member that has demonstrated exceptional performance to accelerate the mission of FAST, a cure for Angelman syndrome. There are many pieces that go into advancing drug development and bringing meaningful and transformative treatments to all of our loved ones living with Angelman syndrome. It is a puzzle and so many pieces are required for success. Our incredible researchers that discover all the steps needed to go from cell to animal, from animal to human. The, clinical, the clinicians who are or will be delivering these therapies to our kiddos. The pharmaceutical or biotech sponsors who know how to get it from bench side to bedside. The regulators who protect our loved ones to ensure the drugs are both safe and efficacious. But the most important piece to this puzzle is our community. The AS community is the only reason that you are all here our loved ones, their caregivers, their family, and their friends. 
the volunteer hours, the blood, sweat, and tears to raise the money needed to get us to where we are today and where we need to go, this is all driven by family and friends, and that is you. This year, we started a small team that is growing into an amazing army, the FAST Advisory Council. This team is a group of volunteers who want to play an active role in the future of AS research and drug development. Through robust efforts in policy, advocacy, fundraising, contract negotiations, education, and the list goes on. But one member of this community stood out after many years of aggressive fundraising, raising his hand to help whenever and wherever he could, seeking out opportunities to utilize his skill set to help FAST. He so strongly believed in the mission and knew that he could support developing an army of volunteers throughout the country to help FAST get this job done faster. So we are so thankful to you for all you are doing and the leadership you are showing as you lead the FAST Advisory Council through the next era of advocacy. The Cure AS Community Accelerator Award goes to Todd Werner. Congratulations to all of our award winners. Uh, now please welcome FAST board member Lauren Hoffer. Thank you very much. It is my sincere privilege to introduce two titans in the fight against rare disease, Cam McLeod and Dr. Preston Campbell. Preston, a pediatric pulmonologist, became interested in cystic fibrosis while working at a, as a CF camp counselor while in medical school. He served as the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation, they served the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation in a leadership capacity for over 20 years, including as its chief medical officer and as its president and chief executive officer from 2015 until he semi-retired in 2019. Cam is a business executive who served on the board of the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation for over 30 years and as its chair from 1999 until earlier this year. Her son, Will, was diagnosed with cystic fibrosis at two years old. When Will was diagnosed in the early 1980s, they were told his life expectancy was 17 years old. During Cam and Preston's joint leadership at the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation, Cystic Fibrosis saw many FDA-approved therapeutics, all of which came from the foundation's seed money and vision, and the life expectancy of most people living with cystic fibrosis is now 66 years old. A true miracle on earth. That said, some living with rare CF genetic mutations are still waiting for their life-altering therapeutic. Cam's son, Will, did not live to see his. Both Cam and Preston remain in the fight against cystic fibrosis, continuing to lend countless hours to the cause. And as they say at the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation, until it is done. They are profoundly generous sources of wisdom and have been and continue to be role models for FAST, both professionally and personally. I am so very honored to be able to introduce to the stage Cam McLeod and Dr. Preston Campbell. Thank you, Lauren, and thank you to all of you for including us in this incredible evening and incredible two days. 
Uh, it's just wonderful to be here, and we're so impressed with all that you have done, and with anticipation, look forward to seeing what you're going to be doing in the future. Both of us, as Lauren said, have been involved in cystic fibrosis mission for decades. Preston was CEO and I was the board chair. And we hope that our story that we share with you tonight will give you encouragement and mostly hope and we'll also give you some ideas that will accelerate some of your progress. So Preston, let's jump in and tell some of our story. Thank you, Cam. Uh, it's great being here. We're so excited to see uh, what you all are doing in, in, with the FAST community and Angelman Syndrome. Uh, it's an honor and uh, we are uh, just glad to share our story, right? So. Let's jump back to 1955, and that was when we started. In 1955, children with cystic fibrosis did not live long enough to go to elementary school. The median survival was essentially five years of age at the time, and it was really a dire situation because there weren't any CF doctors, there weren't any CF clinics, there, weren't any, there wasn't any CF science, uh, there were no CF uh, medicines, and worse, worse, for sure, there was no hope. But if you leap forward to today, today, the median survival is over 60 years of age, as Lauren mentioned. There are 16 CF therapies now available to people with cystic fibrosis. 94% of people with cystic fibrosis have therapies that address the basic defect of cystic fibrosis and have transformative benefits to them. Uh, promising programs are underway to make sure that we get to 100% and hope now abound. So that begs the question, yeah, thank you. So that begs the question that Cam's going to start answering. I'm glad she's going to do this. How did this happen? Thank you, Preston. Okay. So... As Angelman, as FAST also was formed by many parents in this room in 1955, these angels of ours uh, formed the CF Foundation, and it was a situation where it was pretty hopeless. So they had a dream that one day CF would stand for Cure Found. Still amazing to me that all of this happened. They are our heroes, and you understand you have lots of heroes in this room also. Without their courage, we would never be where we are today. They began to raise money and to plan their first big step. And so what was their first step? That first big step happened in 1965. At that time, CF Care was not disorganized, it was unorganized. Based on data from some of the centers, though, that had much better clinical outcomes, the CF Foundation started a CF Care Network, net, uh, Center Network. Each center would provide multidisciplinary care based on evidence-based recommendations. The result of this first step was that CF Care advanced and clinical outcomes improved at these centers of excellence. This work continues today, and there are over 130 care centers across the U.S. that are using quality improvement methodology and the patient registry data to further advance care. Scientists at the institutions where the care centers are located then became interested in CL, which set the stage for the next big step. What was done to create this science that allowed CF therapies to be developed. Thank you. See, this is teamwork. It's always been. By the 1980s, when my son was diagnosed and I got involved, CF survival had increased to 18 years of age. This was only due to improved care. CF science was not advancing and there was a new approach that was needed if new therapies were gonna be developed. Armed with only 
$400,000, we boldly committed $10 million to establish 10 research development centers to advance CF science. These leading academic centers across the country were charged with working together to advance CF science. And it worked. By 1984, the CF basic defect was discovered to be a defective chloride channel. Five years later, CF gene was discovered, giving us the blueprint of CF and opening the door for the development of CF animals and cell lines for research. All of this allowed the science to race forward fast, as you would say. We began to understand what was going wrong in the CF cells and to think of ways to fix it. The evolving science enabled two new CF therapies that addressed lung infections and sticky mucus. There, these were wonderful advances, but no one at that point was focused on creating therapies that fixed the basic defect despite the science being there. So here is the problem. How do you get industry, big, bi big pharma or biotech, to focus their expertise in technology on a rare orphan disease? So Preston. Thank you, Cam. Okay, so now we're gonna tell you how these therapies were developed, so I want you to listen to me. Um, we're, uh, we're now in 19, I'm gonna to try to go back. We're in 1998, the median survival has increased because of care uh, to 27 uh, years of age for people with cystic fibrosis. I actually happened to join the CF Foundation at that time to help Bob Bell with a program that he had designed to entice industry, by industry I mean biotech and pharma, into the CF space because they had the expertise in drug discovery and the tools for drug discovery to help us bring new therapies for people with cystic fibrosis, including therapies that address the basic defect. Because all the science that Cam talked about, where we had committed $10 million with $400,000 in the bank, uh, had transformed our science. We knew a lot about CF, TR, the basic defect, the protein for CF, and how to fix it. But no one was focused on that, so we wanted to fix that. So how did we do that? Well, uh, this program we called the Therapeutics Development Program, and um, what it ultimately it was called Venture Philanthropy by the lay press, but what we did is shown in the bottom right of this slide, we provided uh, financing or money to industry so that their opportunity costs was non-existent. So we paid for their FTEs and things that they did so that there was no financial cost to companies so they could move their money into other programs that they would have liked to have done. We also made sure that they had the scientific expertise that they needed to make the right decision. So we knew who the best scientists were in the field for cystic fibrosis, so we embedded them into their programs. And we knew, and I'm so happy that Liz received an award tonight because she is gonna be, I told her earlier tonight, she's gonna to be the most important person in this room in three or four years. And I think that we were smart enough <laughs> to create a clinical trial network starting with five programs that now has 80 programs across the country to make sure that CF trials, when they're done, are done safely, efficiently, and quickly because Industry wants to make sure that they can, they can take that final step with clinical trials. And then we had a committed community, the CF Foundation staff, the CF Board of Directors, and the CF community were all in lockstep and committed to making sure that we did everything possible to make sure that we would fulfill our mission. We raised $300 million for this program, the Therapeutics Development Program. And I'll tell you, uh, when Bob Bell and I were putting shoe leather to the street, most people thought we had lost our minds. They thought we were crazy to be doing what we were doing, we were gonna fail. Uh, and in fact, most of the programs, and this is just a heads up for you all, and this is part of what drug discovery is all about. Most of the programs that we invested in did not succeed, they failed. But fortunately, 
Many of them did succeed, and that has made all the difference. So if we go forward to today, the, there are 16 therapies, and I'll show you on the next slide what those are, that have been approved for people with cystic fibrosis. That in conjunction with the Care Center Network Improving Care that Cam mentioned earlier, has resulted in the median survival being greater than 60 years of age. That is something that even in my lifetime I didn't think that I would see. So as Lauren said, that is in itself a miracle. But as she also mentioned, we're, we're addressing 94% of people, their, their basic defect, giving them their, this transformative therapy. And I'll just tell you, Kim, don't you agree that our community is unwilling to accept 94%? Absolutely, and my son would have been part of that 6%. Yeah, so, so we aren't going to leave anyone behind. So the fundraising dollars haven't stopped by those who have already uh, received these transformative therapies nor has their involvement stopped. Everyone is in it until the last person with cystic fibrosis benefits from these therapies. And you can see how we're doing. If you go on cff.org, you'll see this slide, the drug development pipeline. And that, we put that there so you can hold us accountable. And at the top of the slide, you'll quickly see the 16 approved therapies that I mentioned. 13 of these are FDA approved therapies. Three are repurposed medicines, such as inhaled hypertonic saline for people with CF that have been proven to be safe and effective in people with CF with extensive clinical trials. So these are all available to pe for people with CF at this time. Below that is our pipeline. And let me just give you a, a handle on the pipeline so you know how to read it. Basically, each bar is a therapeutic program. The height of the bar shows you how close it is to patients. The higher, the closer it is to approval. And each therapy is grouped by therapeutic approach. For example, on the left-hand side in maroon are those therapies that address the basic defects, CFTR or the CF protein. And there are 17 therapies uh, in this program and in, in, in this grouping. And many of these are mutation agnostic. What do I mean by that? It doesn't matter what mutation they have. If that program is successful, then we will reach 100% of people with cystic fibrosis. And so, as you can watch these programs, and we're, we're investing a minimum of $500 million for this now, and I suspect it'll be much more before it's all said and done, to make sure that we get to 100% of people with cystic fibrosis. So, so watch this. The other, the other uh, sectors or targets are the thick, sticky mucus of, of the, in the lungs of people with cystic fibrosis, in, inflammation, infection, and the nutritional status for people with cystic fibrosis. So, um, let me, before I pass the baton one last time to Cam, let me say one last thing as a source of encouragement for you all. I don't think there's ever been a more exciting time in medicine than we're in today. This is, it has to be the most exciting time that we've ever lived in in medicine. The scientific advances are incredible. Thank you, scientists. They're creating opportunities that were unimaginable uh, even five or 10 years ago. The approaches are gonna be different three years from now than they are today even. We're learning as we go. We're gonna be better positioned to make a difference in the lives of everyone. I've never been more optimistic about the future of cystic fibrosis and many other orphan diseases, including Angelman syndrome. And I'm thankful for you all who are leading the way and creating hope in your disease. And I will just tell you, because of all that I just mentioned, I'm pretty positive that the best is yet to come. So you need hope. So thank you, Preston. And so hopefully, you know, you've heard our story and you can see the similarities between the work that CF has done over the years and 
the fast work that is going on literally right now. You should also be very excited because you've already made such incredible progress. We are so proud and touched to be involved with you tonight and over the last couple of days and just to feel the energy and the excitement and, and be a part of that. So uh, there are now, you know, clinics for people with the AS located across the country. Patient, patient registry exists. You're rapidly expanding science and advancing science will enable many more therapies. And like CF, FAST has recruited industry into AS to exploit these amazing scientific breakthroughs that Preston has talked about. So how do you get there? Fundraising is a key. And an intense focus, laser focus on mission is absolutely necessary. So you're creating hope. But you're not done, and we're not either. So please, collaborate. You're in it together, and you're stronger together. Remember that laser focus on mission. Be bold, be courageous as you already have been and continue that so as you develop new therapies and thoughtfully accept that risk that's involved. And there are gonna be failures, but learn from them because that's valuable knowledge. And use data to your advantage. So we encourage you to dare to dream and to allude to your, your uh, theme this, this week, dream big, and we know you will. <laughs> we thank you for involving us and inviting us to be with you these last couple days. It's been a real joy, and it will continue to be, and we will follow your success as you work hard for Ben and Quincy and every family member uh, involved in this room and online. We just wish you all the success and all the blessings in the world. Thank you. What you two have done is absolutely remarkable, and we can only dream to accomplish half or a quarter of what you've done. And thank you for being mentors to Angelman Syndrome, because we know we're gonna be better because of you. Thank you. So tonight, it is my honor to introduce you to one of the most inspirational individuals that I've ever met, Dr. Elizabeth Berry Kravis, AKA, Otherwise known as Liz, EBK, LBK, Dr. Barry Kravis, Dr. Barry Kravis, or just refer to her as the woman who is just a total and complete badass who just knows how to get it done. I met Liz for the first time at our second um, Angelman Syndrome Biomarker and Alchemation Consortium meeting at this FAST event in December of 2017. She was invited to speak on her experience in Fragile X, another rare neurologic disease like AS, to discuss trials and tribulations of clinical endpoints for the numerous clinical trials that she had led in Fragile X, over 25 different trials she led. She cared personally for over 700 patients with Fragile X syndrome, leading their translational research initiatives for over two decades. She had led more trials for numerous other rare neurodevelopmental disorders than anyone in the world, especially when it involved novel, innovative therapies where drugs or biologics needed to be delivered directly into the brain or the spinal fluid of individuals 
Something 10 to 15 years ago was actually considered near science fiction. Liz took a leap and she said, I will work every day to improve their lives as I believe that this incredible science will make a huge difference. At that time, she was not working in the AS field specifically, but as a pediatric neurologist, she had some exposure to individuals with Angelman syndrome. And we knew that we can try and leverage her vast experience to expedite clinical trial readiness for our needs. What she did not realize at that time was that when the AS community wants something, we go for it. And within merely a year, we won her over. Like everything else in AS, we find the best in the world and we convince them that Angelman syndrome is worth fighting for. Well, she did not need much convincing and she started getting very involved in Angelman syndrome translational research initiatives with the goal of one day running our first transformative clinical trial. Fast forward to March 10th, 2020, days before the pandemic was called a pandemic, EBK treats the first individual living with Angelman syndrome in the world with a potentially disease-modifying therapy called an antisense oligonucleotide, or ASO, which is meant to activate the silent copy of the gene our kids are missing. The very first in the world. Three days later, the entire world shut down. Most clinical trial sites that were ready to enroll patients in this trial closed all activities related to non-COVID conditions. Liz, she refused. She could not bear to think about pausing all we had worked so hard for as a community. She fought, negotiated, maneuvered, pushed on, and she was the only person in the world opening and enrolling to see patients. Six months later, she's the first in the US to enroll for the next ASO trial, and 18 months later, the next. Dr. Barry Cravis has the fire in her belly to push boundaries, fight for what's right for patients and families, and participate in initiatives to advance drug development for every neurodevelopmental disorder in the world, and is willing to work harder, longer, and faster just to get it done. I serve on a few advisory boards with Liz, both within and outside of the Angelman syndrome space. And any neurodevelopmental disorder that is working toward advancing a program to a clinical trial, whether it's a gene therapy, gene editing, ASO, novel technology, always, they say, let's ask Liz how we should approach this. Let's ask Liz what we should do. Let's talk to Liz about what she's done. This is truly a legend around the world as someone who lives to see drug development advance for kids like ours. So I asked her when she might retire. It wasn't meant to be rude. I mean, she's small and mighty and strong, but she's getting a little gray. And, and her response was, I will not retire until I see an approval for Angelman syndrome with one of these transformative treatments. And I am... And she added, I'm confident that that will happen. Then on to more. Well, she said the same thing for Fragile X and Neiman Pick, so she's not retiring. She also said that she bikes to work in negative temperatures, runs six to seven days a week, takes seven flights of stairs to and from her office all day because she needs to have the body of a 30-year-old to live as long as she plans to live to ensure that she witnesses these transformations. For this, Liz, we are forever grateful. You are the heart and soul of clinical trials in Angelman syndrome and so many other rare diseases. I recently learned that Liz has enrolled over 75% of all patients in AS, ASO clinical trials in the United States, and over 50% of all of them globally. How and why? Despite her being an unbelievable machine, it's been made crystal clear that not everyone can or will or should have to go to Chicago to enroll in a clinical trial or ultimately be treated after there are approvals. We need to expand what she is doing in Chicago to everyone else around the world. As we get closer to phase three trials where hundreds of patients, not dozens of patients, will need to be enrolled when the numerous gene therapy trials get started and early phase studies, more and more programs across, need to cross the line from animal studies to human studies, which is happening right this very minute. Something became very crystal clear. We need many more programs around the world that can function like this machine that Liz created. We need to ensure that the current trial centers that exist through the Angelman Syndrome Foundation clinics, which are amazing clinics, holistic care clinics, that they expedite patient enrollment in large numbers. 
Additionally, they must be ready to treat patients once drugs are approved in even larger numbers than they have the capacity to do. And right now, other sites outside of, of Rush and Chicago are enrolling one to two patients per year, where Liz is enrolling one to two patients per day. This is not for a lack of effort or desire or knowledge. It's really infrastructure and availability, both of which we can fix with proper funding and know-how. There are ways to close this gap through improving institutional infrastructure, training doctors to become clinical trialists in addition to their existing skill sets as amazing clinicians, and provide financial support to make sure that we can help them get this job done, to ensure they have regulatory coordinators, contract teams, anesthesia teams, and they're all part of the process and the vision. So over a year ago, Liz and I started dreaming about what this would look like for Angelman syndrome and so many other rare diseases that she's so passionate about treating. How can we create a training center to rapidly train true clinical trialists to most effectively and efficiently run trials to meet the need and the demand of our community and the need and demand of pharmaceutical companies? There are only four active trials right now and in 18 to 24 months it's predicted to be eight. How can we handle this and increase the momentum for everyone around the world? In addition, how do we train these doctors to best deliver these novel therapies, innovative treatments in the best and safest way once these drugs are approved? People cannot just travel to the clinical cent trial centers but must have access at all highly reputable hospitals in all parts of the world. How do we arborize this expertise exponentially? These drugs we are talking about are not just pills. They're therapies that will be delivered into the spinal fluid, into the brain tissue, or into the brain compartments. This requires the right people to deliver these therapies with proper training, anesthesia teams, pharmacy teams, to know the best practices of dealing with drugs and biologics, while also knowing the population of our kiddos and their families. This is where the dream turned into reality. After much diligence and care on how we best execute this dream, FAST has committed to launch an innovative clinical trial center to train clinicians around the world to most effectively and efficiently run clinical trials and deliver these therapies because the demand is far larger and we need to arborize this skill set globally. So the Rush Pediatric Neuroscience is now launching the first FAST Center for Translational Research. The center... <laughs> This center will focus on innovative and interventional therapies for patients with Angelman syndrome, and, and, and that will ultimately lead to other neurodevelopmental disorders. And this center will be global. It'll be the pace setter or the flagship to teach, teach all of the eager clinicians around the world how to best run clinical trials and deliver these therapies that are complicated. Over the long term, this is what is absolutely necessary. This center will train two fellows a year who are eager to make clinical trials and innovative therapies their career. One will be national and one will be international. This fellowship will be a fully paid program to ready the next generation of clinicians and advance clinical trial capabilities and drug delivery for Angelman syndrome outside of the lovely town of Chicago. Additionally, this center will, become, will welcome any doctor for shorter stints of time that are currently running clinical trials that want to learn how to become the most efficient at delivering these therapies and executing upon the needs of the efforts that require for, by trials, with the vision to arborize this training throughout the world. So FAST is committed to launch additional centers, both in the United States and internationally, over the next five years. And this training will hopefully be very collaborative and complementary to the current AS clinics. The program will help us staff these additional centers who can accommodate infrastructure required so that the efficiency and growth can easily occur and support people around the world, having more access. We have all witnessed the research landscape growing from creating the infrastructure to accommodate the needs of research in cell lines to animal models. And now the programs allow us to change the trajectory and advance and accelerate research to human patients, something we could not say two years ago. There is no better person or partner who is ready to arborize this vision to the entire world. So with that, it is my greatest honor 
for me to introduce you to Dr. Elizabeth Barry Kravis, the director of the Rush Pediatric Neuroscience FAST Center for Translational Research. Thank you, Allison, for that very, very generous introduction. I'll accept the part about the gray hair. Um, <laughs> and thank you to FAST and everyone involved in planning this event for inviting me to come and try to express my enthusiasm for where we are in the Angelman syndrome field right now and our progress toward real life treatments for this condition. Um, but. You know, we've heard a lot at this meeting, kind of amazing things, one after another. And does anyone wonder where in the Angelman syndrome field we might be, say, five years from now? So um, I'm going to show you a little short video movie that my Rush team and I put together to try to give you our vision of Angelman syndrome program in five years. We tried not to get too far ahead of ourselves, but just, you know, what could happen. Um, so it's called Angelman syndrome 2027. and. They're supposed to play it right now. <laughs> Oops, we don't have any sound. Okay. Rush Angelman, Duke 15 Clinic. This is Katie. Hey, Katie, it's Kendall. I'm in clinic today, and I've got a one-week-old girl who tested positive on the newborn screen for Angelman syndrome. Which one's like a deletion? Okay, hold on one second. Dr. Barry Cravis? <laughs> Kendall's on the phone. It looks like we had um, a patient test positive for Angelman syndrome on the newborn screen this morning. Okay, let's get this one dosed tomorrow. Um, we will need to confirm the genetic diagnosis and get insurance approval. Tell Kendall to send them for confirmation at the lab. All right, Kendall, did you hear that? Yep. Yeah, so if you can send them over for the UBE3A methylation and do the pre-ASO labs, that would be great. All right, will do. Thanks. Okay. Can you meet them at the outpatient lab and get the blood to Lily for methylation? Um, we can collect extra blood to confirm the type of Angelman syndrome later, um, but methylation should be adequate for insurance since um, the ASOs are approved for all types of Angelman. Yeah, that sounds good. I'll go ahead and meet them there now. And this is where we will get the blood draw done. Okay. Right. The blood draw. <laughs> Hi, I'm Dr. Barry Cravis. Hi. Nice to meet you. Yes. We just met with the genetic counselor, um, and we wanted to get some more information, so we looked it up on the internet, and it's not looking good. Yeah, from what we found out, it looks like the baby will not be able to speak, might not even walk. Watch out, be able to live a normal life. So, five years ago, it would be a common outcome for children with Angelman syndrome not to speak, and some not to walk, but now we do a little better. We have approved drugs called antisense oligonucleotides, or ASOs, that turn on the UBE3A gene from the father. Okay, yeah, we, we understood that. We spoke with the genetic counselor and they explained to us that the mother's gene making the UBE3A, the father's gene being turned off. Our baby is most likely missing the paternal gene being turned on. Our question is, is these ASOs, are they a cure? So it's not a cure but a substantial improvement from what we saw with Angelman syndrome um, in terms of their development before the ASOs. And if we see development progressing too slowly on the ASO, we can enroll you in a combination therapy trial. The key thing is to get this ASO started as soon as possible, and then we can follow the baby in our developmental follow-up program. We will plan to do the treatment tomorrow, once we get insurance approval and the genetic confirmation back. Thank you so much, Doctor. That's fast. I look forward to it. Here's the genetic result you wanted. Positive for Angelman syndrome. Hey, Maura, can you scan this to insurance? Yes, I can. Hi, I need the representative for patient 166453 for the Angelman ASO. This baby tested positive by newborn screening. Uh, yeah, I called before, and I also just emailed you the scanned DNA result confirming the diagnosis. The doctor wants to treat tomorrow. 
Okay, um, one second. I have the confirmation number in my email. IDS Pharmacy. Hi, we have a newborn screen positive Angelman baby. Do you have the ASO in stock? Yes, I believe we do. Perfect. As always, EBK wants to dose tomorrow. Of course. Awesome. And we will send order and insurance approval as soon as we get it. We will need the prescription by 3 p.m. Yes, we know that you want the prescription by 3 p.m. Are we all set for tomorrow with the new baby? Yes, everything is set. Uh, we sent in the order set to the pharmacy by 2.55 p.m. So it was before 3 p.m., so no complaints there. And we are also good with anesthesia, that now we don't have to fight to reserve our vacuum spot. So, and then we have our own anesthesiology team, so it's all good. We're good okay. to go. Okay, good. So. Okay, I've got a newborn screen, Angelman baby, and five others in the anesthesia room tomorrow. The baby will have anesthesia standby just in case we can't get her to calm down enough to do the infusion without sedation. And um, I have a new seven-year-old, uh, Angel, um, um, from clinic with a mutation. He was diagnosed late because he didn't have seizures and uh, no, no one did uh, a sequencing test on him. Uh, with him, I have a total of, I have four others for anesthesia and with him will be five. Okay, then that's 11. We can do that. After I'm done with the, my anesthesia cases, I'll jump to the other four Angelman syndrome kids who've graduated from anesthesia in the no anesthesia room. And you guys can finish an anesthesia. Okay, so that's 15 total cases for tomorrow. I think that's a record. Um, it's going to be all hands on deck, so I'll talk to Orji and make sure we have everything ready and set to go for tomorrow. Okay, I have the infusion. Let, Let us change, change this baby's, baby's life. Starting now. Okay, that's our dream for 2027. We don't know exactly how accurate it is, um, but we're working toward it. Um, this is the uh, stars of, the, of, the, of Angelman Syndrome 2027 who are helping me push the envelope every day to bring those new treatments to people with Angelman Syndrome. And as you saw, they are dreaming big um, of life-changing treatments for all those of all ages with Angelman Syndrome in the next five years. You will be able to find these stars on the dance floor tonight, for sure. Um, so seriously, though, why do I think this is the future of Angelman syndrome? I'll give you three reasons. One, the genetic cause of Angelman is well-defined, and the treatment strategies being developed are scientifically sound and mechanism-based. Two, multiple different treatments are being developed rapidly, simultaneously, in the preclinical space and in both academia and industry. And three, things I have on this phone from antisense oligonucleotide trial patients um, who've texted me various videos. And I'm not gonna say which trials, and I can't show you anything on this phone, but if I could show you, it would be the Angelman syndrome kids I treat gaining skills at a rate that patients with standard deletion or mutation Angelman syndrome do not typically gain skills after they're over four years old. Doing things I personally didn't think were really possible over that short of a period of time. And some videos that literally knock your socks off. Kids learning to swim, to run, to jump, to say words, to ride a trike, to sleep through the night. <clears throat> and to sleep through the night. Not, <laughs> not every video I get sent is that way, but if some are, it means we're on the right track. Um, so I'm gonna show you a data slide, only one. Um, and what I'm gonna try to, this is another reason why I think we're on the right track. This is the first five patients in the genetic study, and this has been pre presented elsewhere. And what this graph shows you, actually, let me see, is the dotted line, the red dotted line here shows you the amount of progress that a person with Angelman syndrome uh, in natural history makes in these areas of the Vineland in a year. 
Okay, so it's the, it's the rate of gain. And this is that natural history study that Wenhan and Lynn Bird and Anjali and Ann Wheeler and everybody has been working on for a long time and we've been a part of for the past five years. Um, so you can see the usual rate of progress here is pretty slow. In other words, like a third of a month in one year for receptive language and a tenth of a month in expressive language and two thirds of a month in um, fine motor and a half a month in gross motor. And so these are projected um, rates of gain but in these kids, in the trial, they were gaining um, two months, 10 months, um, three, four months. So the rates of gain were, were higher. And these patients were still not making progress as fast as normal. And sometimes they might be gaining small things that don't seem like a big deal. And sometimes they might be making incremental grains that are even too small to be assessed by the Vineland. Um, but um, to me, the fact that I can see this picture is uh, it's, it's important that the rate has changed. And the fact that they can learn things, even small things, more rapidly than expected, which is, is, is really simply a sign that we're on the right track for improving function in Angelman syndrome. Um, so we don't know what can be seen over the long term with, with chronic treatment, at what age. Um, this could be a cure. Um, it could be it could be it will need combinations of other treatments. And this is a book that we have yet to write, but we are going to write it over the next five years. Um, <laughs> So we have multiple things coming forward into the clinic, right? Um, we have, uh, and these are all going toward clinical trials, and we need to be able to work on these simultaneously and as quickly as, as possible. And we have things like um, ASOs, stem cell therapy, um, RNA editing, um, brain connectivity drugs that work on synapses, gene therapy, and even shRNA. So we have a lot of different mechanisms coming forward, and we need to get anything that's safe and has benefit approved for use in clinic, because it's unlikely that any one drug will be a complete cure for everyone. Multi-drug combinations are likely to give us the best improvements and maybe a cure, because here we can have stepwise improvements through additive effects by targeting different aspects of the disease process and by increasing the numbers and types of neurons that are targeted by one delivery strategy or another. So basically Basically, we, we, we may have things fail, but we need multiple shots on goal. And so we need to follow every lead, leave no stone unturned, and climb every mountain. I don't know if we need any more idioms, but um, this, is a, this is one of my favorite pictures to show the Fragile X families, um, because it's really the same concept as here in Angelman Syndrome, and it's the climb every mountain picture. I'm not going to play the song, but we're, you know, the, the concept is there. We need, in Angelman Syndrome, we need to climb every mountain. But climbing every mountain is a lot of work. How do we keep it from taking forever? Um, and so what we need to do is um, have, have centers. We can't, run any one, we can't run one trial at a time. We have to run multiple trials all at the same time. And yet there are these endless institutional processes that keep us from speeding through trials, for instance. Um, sites don't get open, trials don't get started on time, recruitment can take a long time. The families all want these treatments now. Um, the over 200 families on my ever-growing wait list, and even those who don't know, I don't, those who don't even know I have a wait list, but institutions are never in a hurry, and the FDA is not always in a hurry. So coordinators and study teams have to climb over these institutional hurdles one at a time, and the burden is compounded when you're trying to do multiple trials. Um, study staff become overwhelmed. Does this look like what any of the other Angelman coordinators feel like at their sites? Um, and so, so we, we really need clinical trial centers that have the staffing and the infrastructure to move these treatments forward all at the same time, including um, early phase trials and the large phase three trials that will be upon us soon. Um, and centers can be tooled up to speed through the institutional barriers and reduce start times, but we're really going to have to focus on this. Um, and we need to move, we're going to need to move lots of patients through the process. Academic centers are really underfunded to cover the needs of this type of, of initiative. Um, and so we need funding for major clinical trial programs for Angelman syndrome and um, other neurodevelopmental disorders. Um, so basically, we need things like space. Um, we need 
things like, ef like efficient anesthesia access, child-friendly areas for patients to wait in, and um, we need coordinators to fight the institution and the CROs and keep everything moving. Um, and so building these clinical trial programs is the next step in getting these treatments to all patients everywhere through regulatory approvals and in having sites that can deliver treatment to large numbers of patients both before and after drug approvals and then pursue and enact the development of combination treatments. Um, so we also need to have trained scientists who can run these centers and have learned how to move trials forward in their institution and who know how to gather resources within the institution. These physician scientists are not trained in trial science um, during their residencies and fellowships. They don't learn about how to do a trial in Angelman syndrome or neurodevelopmental disability. We did train them and let them go forth and populate um, numerous other trial programs throughout the world and really train other centers to, to we train others in a pay it forward kind of expansion of expertise so that we can move from one center to multiple centers to centers all over the world. So at Rush, we are very grateful to the Angelman Syndrome Foundation for formally kickstarting us in the Angelman field with clinic funding to develop a strong program for clinical care and so that we can work on the Ladder Learning Network and other projects. And we are extremely, extremely grateful to receive this substantial funding from FAST for the separate but complementary initiative to create the new Rush FAST Center for Translational Research in Pediatric Neurosciences, a clinical trial and translational research program in Angelman syndrome and other rare neurodevelopmental disorders at Rush. And I look forward to the day when uh, the clinical trial program and the clinical program merge because they are now one and the same since we have approved treatments that fix the disorder. Um, so we will keep our part of the bargain to run every scientifically based Angelman syndrome trial we can and, cl and climb every mountain, and we will run these efficiently to speed up timelines. We will continue to learn from trials in all neurodevelopmental disorders and collaborate with all as working together is how we make our best progress. And it's important to state that the Rush Center is just a prototype is what is needed, and future centers will be needed to establish, to be established with evolving templates based on how we see the field evolving and how we learn from the Rush experience. Um, but for now, the funding for this flagship program will allow us to be able to increase regulatory manpower, get more space, including child-friendly play space, train some of the next generation of Angelman and, and NDD trialists for the future centers, and we hope we can even bring anesthesia to our outpatient research center so that we can increase volume and decrease time at the hospital and annoyance at the hospital for patients that are receiving intrathecal treatments. Um, anyone starting a program elsewhere for trials in Angelman syndrome can come and visit us. Our door is always open. We can try to help by showing how we do things, much as many physicians starting Fragile X programs over the past 20 years have come and spent time with us to see what we do and what can fit into their own institutional structure. Going forward, I hope to see many more centers funded to do the important work of delivering investigational and subsequently approved therapies to significantly change the lives of everyone with Angelman syndrome across the world so that everywhere all can realize the dream of our Angelman syndrome 2027 video. Uh, when my, I just want to make a comment. When my 91-year-old dad saw the FAST post yesterday about the Translational Research Center, he sent me a really um, appropriate text, messages, text message that said, may the wind be at your back, which is so in line of our goal of pushing things forward. Uh, and so my team... So my team will keep pushing until we reach this, this dream, and with your support, which can fuel the necessary research and clinical trial centers, we continue to dream big. And together, oops, I need my next slide. Okay, there's the center. Um, and together, I really can't help doing this, we are rushing faster <laughs> to get... <laughs> Away. 
to get to the goal of every person with Angelman treat syndrome treated as fast as possible. Thank you for listening. Thank you for your support and your partnership. Let's all dance tonight to the future in which we change Angelman syndrome. Thank you so much, Dr. Barry Kravis. I think I speak for every parent in the room when I say that we hope your five-year plan, your five-year dream, absolutely comes true. So good evening, everyone. Um, for those who I have not had the pleasure to meet yet, I'm Kelly David, and I am the co-vice chair of the Foundation for Angelman Syndrome Therapeutics. And it is an honor and humbling experience to be standing here before you. Like the majority of the people in this room, I'm a parent of a child with Angelman Syndrome. My son is almost eight years old. Because of AS, he is non-speaking. He has difficulty walking, intense seizures, and challenges completing activities that you or I do with such ease. But like your loved ones with Angelman syndrome, he is so much more than AS. He is a clever, silly little boy with thoughts, wants, needs, and dreams of his own. He enjoys swimming, he likes avocado, and when we're all awake at 1 a.m., which I'm sure many of you can relate to, he enjoys car rides around our quiet town. Angelman syndrome has taken so much from him, from all of us, but with the help of FAST and the incredible labs, pharmas, researchers, industry partners, putting in countless hours to help our loved ones, the one thing we cling on to are our big dreams. As we cruise around our sleeping town with our windows down and the wind blowing through his sandy blonde hair, I turn on the song that you're about to hear and I sing it to him and I imagine that he sings along too. With four drugs and human clinical trials and more coming soon, we have moved from a cure for Angelman syndrome being a pipe dream to a real, tangible, big dream for all of us. We dream of better communication, fewer seizures, improved motor skills, sleep, and more for our loved ones. Most importantly though, we dream for the day that they can fulfill their own big dreams. It's my pleasure to introduce this year's gala video. I was never one for letting go. Quincy. It felt like everybody had to let me know. What the hell you doing, kid? All the plans you're making getting way too big. They tell me I'm broken out of my mind. In the clouds, I'm doing just fine. Shooting for greatness, aimed at the sky. I won't know till I try. Here, you sit here. 
dream of hearing my daughter's voice. We dream of Michelle telling us everything. I dream of a time when Ethan can tell me his own needs with his own voice. Oh, they told me to bring up my tissues and I forgot it was at the table, babe. Can you bring up the tissues? Um, so I'm here tonight to talk about dreams. We all have them. Some of us daydream, some of us night dream, but we all dream. We had dreams when we were children of the life that we would live as adults. And we had dreams as adults of the lives our children would lead when they're adults. When I was pregnant with my oldest daughter, Kai, I thought about what she would be when she grew up. A pediatric neurologist, obviously. <laughs> why? I'm not sure why, <laughs> I don't know. That's what I imagined, because at the time, that's what I thought I would have been if I were to do it all over again. I dreamed she would go to Princeton, she would live with her aunt and uncle, and she would be close enough to her parents, but far enough away to be independent. I dreamed that she would meet the partner of her dreams, and feel full satisfaction in all that she did in life. I dreamed that she would ooze with happiness and joy. Two years later, I dreamed that I would have another child. And here's the secret. I really wanted another little girl. I'm sorry, Dad. I know you wanted a grandson. Sisters are just the best, and I know that because I have one. Well, that dream came true, and I found out I was pregnant with a beautiful little girl. What will she be when she grows up? Where will she live? Who will she marry? I dream for her to be happy, fulfilled, successful, and satisfied. We named her Quincy. In choosing that name, I dreamed of this gorgeous young lady out with her girlfriends in New York City at a bar. And all of the boys asking their friends, who is that girl we keep hearing about named Quincy? Silly dream, maybe, likely, but it is what it is, I had that dream. Well, five months after this beautiful little girl named Quincy was born, we received a phone call. Dr. Brent, I have catastrophic news for you. Quincy has a rare genetic condition called Angelman syndrome. Our dreams totally shattered. All of them destroyed. I can only imagine, so were hers. We read everything we could about Angelman syndrome, and it was made very clear, very quickly, that Quincy may never walk. She will not talk. She will never get married. She will never go to college. She will never go on a date. She will never have a life partner. She would never live an independent life, the one thing and the only thing we want for our children. And I started to hate myself for dreaming. My, my dreams felt like failures. And the five-month little girl who did nothing wrong never even had a chance to dream. I learned everything I could about Angelman syndrome, and I refused to accept this faith for her. I refused to believe that what I was reading was true. I refuse to believe that modern medicine did not have more in store for monogenetic rare diseases like Angelman syndrome and for Quincy. At the same time, as I reflect, I sadly tempered my dreams. I reset my expectations to dream about a little girl that might walk, a little girl that would communicate in any way, I didn't care how, but in some way, a little girl that maybe would feed herself, a little girl that would make friends, or at least one. And a little girl that would be respected, protected, and loved by those that we trusted to be with her. A little girl, or maybe a big girl, that would never be abused if she could not protect herself. A parent's biggest nightmare. Then I was introduced to FAST. I started to talk to anyone and everyone that had published anything on Angelman syndrome, 
and most of you are in this room. So thank you for taking my call. You were hopeful, you were humble, you were honest, and you were ready. I began to really understand the science and all the work that FAST was funding to advance technology toward treatments for Angelman syndrome. I began to see the promise of what could be. I began to realize the steps we needed to take to make it a reality for our kids. It was so very clear that it was an incredible decade to be a mouse with Angelman syndrome. But unfortunately, it was not yet the right decade to be a human with Angelman syndrome. But we were ready to change that. So what was next? I began to dream again. I began to dream of what ifs, the what cans, the whys, the why nots. I began to see the possibilities and wipe away any option of impossibility. I thank the scientists in this room that gave me the ammunition to be able to dream again. The pharmaceutical companies that saw value in Angelman syndrome as a marketable disease to invest in changing the lives of individuals and the clinicians in the room who believed in Quincy and believed she would have a different life than that what was pasted on gene reviews the day she was diagnosed. As I watched the science progress and move from cell lines to animal models to the promise of human clinical trials, in not only one program, which was where we were the day she was diagnosed, but to 25 programs today. I realized that our ability to dream is what allows us to see a reality that a decade ago was not even considered an option. Our willingness to dream allowed us to take moonshots that people told us would never pan out. Our demand to dream allowed us to stand in front of you tonight and tell you there are four active clinical trials in human patients right now, with another three reaching clinical trials in the near term, and a dozen more platforms being rapidly advanced. This is no longer a dream, but it's an actual reality, a reality that so many other rare disorders only wish that they were living. So if you ask me today, what will Quincy be when she grows up? My answer is whatever she wants. Because everything and anything is possible. I have watched her walk when I was told she would not. I have watched her swim when I was told she would not. I have watched her communicate in her own way when I was told she never could, and I have watched her dance, I have watched her swoon everyone around her with love, laughter, and spirit, which nothing I could have ever imagined she would do. The things she has done are incredible. I am so proud of who she is and the things she does, as they are hard, but I have also allowed myself to dream for more for her, for a seizure-free life, for a full night's sleep, for Quincy to easily tell me what hurts, to tell me about her day and about her best friend named Aria and how they danced at school together in gym class and brought their teachers to tears. I want her to tell me about that day. I understand that it's a risk to dream, but it is a risk that this mama is worth taking. I am willing to take this risk, and these dreams I have, I cannot control. I have full expectations that I will watch her go to college, get a meaningful job, and live an independent life. I do, I have those dreams. From the bottom of my heart, I allow myself to dream that this will be her reality, and I hope you will allow yourselves to dream with me. I know it's hard. We all are fraught with fears of the unknown and fears of disappointment. But when I let my guard down, I dream, and I dream big, and I'm finally not scared to share that. I have these dreams for all of our children and grandchildren. I look in your eyes and I dream. I dream that one day one of your children will be the one standing at this stage and giving this speech. They will tell you about that time when Angelman syndrome was cured and gave them their voice. And I will sit in the audience and realize that our big dreams came true and all of us played a part. 
We are so close to bringing transformative treatments to everyone in the world living with Angelman syndrome. This is because of you, our community. You have funded over $30 million of research to fast to robustly advance 16 different platforms forward for Angelman syndrome. Today, only four programs are in the clinic. There are many more that we need to get there, but what has been made very clear over the past six months is that these financial tumultuous times and the priorities of drug companies are sadly shifting, which has resulted in nine programs in Angelman syndrome either being paused or canceled. This was not because of negative scientific results, that I can accept. This was for shifting financial priorities and that I will never accept. Angelman syndrome will always be the priority for us here at FAST, and we will never slow down a program from developing that looks promising and safe if we have the money to pay for it. This is why we will continue to advance every single shot on goal and not stop at a single therapy because we are turbocharged. No disease was cured with a first and only drug. We need to find the best therapy or a combination of therapy which might be needed, which will have the best and greatest impact on our loved ones for every age and for every genotype. The more we can advance each program, the faster it will reach humans and become the low-hanging fruit for pharmaceutical companies to take it and run and help us to remain the priority for all. This is expensive. The closer to get, we get to humans, the more expensive it becomes. It is so exciting that we are not only funding drug development programs themselves, but we're committed to funding the training of the doctors to deliver these therapies, which is very complicated. We have rapidly advanced drug development from cells to mice to rats to pigs, but finally to humans. The fact that we are at this stage where we can now invest and accelerate more centers around the world to have the capacity to deliver these therapies to humans is a dream and shows how far we have come, but the costs are just exponential. So we need you to continue fundraising. We are willing to dream big, but dreaming big has a cost. So please stand with me and don't be scared. Don't be scared to think. Don't be scared to imagine. Don't be scared to dream. It's time for all of us to dream big. Because remember, we're not only making the impossible, the impossible possible, but we're totally making it probable. We're gonna start the paddle raise, and I want you to think about all the things that could happen. There are paddles on your tables, and if you don't have them at your plate, they're sitting somewhere on your table. They should have your name on it. So everyone just hold your paddles, and, and what we're gonna do, for those of you that haven't been here before, is that we are going to call out numbers and we're gonna just dream big and we're gonna do our best to raise as much money as we can tonight to know that every dollar you are raising is going to make our big dreams possible. So we're gonna start tonight with a paddle raise. Of $1 million. Because why not, let's dream big. Can you raise it again? Because I can't see that number. 228. Next is 500,000. 061. Three hundred and fifty thousand. One, three, one. Three hundred thousand. Two, oh, five. Three, nine, three. Two hundred and fifty thousand. 200,000. 045. 150,000. 
0.028. This is amazing. 100,000. Four, thank you. Four, seven, nine. There was one in the back. Can you keep your paddle up in the back? What was it? Five, twenty-four. Seventy-five thousand. Fifty thousand. Two, four, zero. One, four, three. What is it? One, eight, nine. I can't hear you. One, four, three. One, four, three. Twenty five thousand. One oh nine. Two five three. Was it five seven eight? Five oh seven. One zero three. Three nine zero. Two nine three. Sorry, guys, the lights are really bright in my eyes. I apologize, I can't see. Fifteen thousand. Ten thousand. Five, four, three. Five, oh, five. Five, eleven. Two, sixteen. One, three, five. Five, two, zero. Four zero eight. Seventy five hundred. There's an alarm, so somebody needs to raise for seventy five hundred and set their alarm. Five thousand. Zero five zero zero eight seven three zero nine one hundred six five zero four seven three three two two three two eight one six four five six two two one four five two seven one seven four is there another twenty five hundred three four nine one one five two three one. Kenna, what does that say in the back? Kenna, what does that say? One five zero. One five zero. One is that one eight five? Yes. One eight five. I'm getting old these eyes. Come on. I know. I'm gonna give me some readers. 
1,500. Three, three, seven, four, seven, seven, one, nine, seven, three, six, zero, zero, six, three, one, four, nine. Oh, there's a lot back there. Zero, seven, zero, four, five, two. Four zero one zero five four one three nine one nine one one thousand dollars. That's the magic one. Four nine eight zero nine one. Four nine nine five zero eight one thousand two o three two four five three seven two four two two zero eight five. Four two zero four o oh, four four five one five three five one one two 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 one I can't see back there three nine seven two two five thank you. Zero zero four one two zero one uh, sorry two seven three one two zero I got one seven six four zero zero two eight two three zero zero five two one Five nine two zero nine six one six three one eight three zero eight two one two six three five nine zero nine two thank you zero six zero one four seven Zero three three one seven six There's so many that they're having added up. Seven hundred and fifty dollars. Five Three five three four two seven five nine five one eight eight four six six one one seven three three eight one zero five three six eight one two eight Five three four three four zero one zero five five three seven 
four, you have the lucky, four, four, four. It's a good one. Anything I'm missing? Anything I'm missing? Okay, $250. Zero nine three two five five zero one five zero seven five three seven seven three five two 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 three four seven two eight nine. Two six eight one 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 back I can't see two five nine four nine three five six seven one zero seven Billy Yoko, what do you got back there? What's that number? That's my boy. What's that number? 490? 490. Thank you, Billy. 361? Yep. Okay, good. 378 Four four six one five two one two five three zero oh, five. I'm being whistled at. Four one eight. Anybody else? Anybody else? Anybody else? Okay, one hundred dollars. Zero four zero four nine six five one seven three two seven five uh, sorry two nine seven one zero one. I have Nora. Uh, three, six, four. Thank you. Two, five, one. Three, five, one. Four, nine, five. Okay, so we're gonna stop the paddle raise there, but what I'd like to ask anyone is if I did not call out a number that you would like to donate, you can actually make that donation by going to one of the people taking the paddles or to this young lady right up here. And I would also like to say that we have one final um, raise or uh, um, activity that we would like to do. So anybody that has a paddle that they're still holding on to or that's at your table and you would like to put it in the center of your table, it will be used as a donation for $100 if you've just changed your mind and decided you want to give a little bit more. And the best part is that whatever paddles we pick up for $100 in the middle of the table, we're going to raffle off randomly a lottery for you to be able to win one of three <laughs> fast onesies that happen to fit the size of a large man that might be able to weigh between 150 and 225 pounds. And you will be chosen to wear the first of its kind, authentic onesie for fast. And you're required to wear that next year to the Science Summit all day. 476 right there. Yes, the onesie goes to you. So leave your paddles in the middle of the table. If you do not want to donate another $100, fold your paddle and put it somewhere else. Okay, uh, the other one? Oh, you want the other one? Okay. All right, well, That's we it. have three. There you go. 202, Derek, 
It's yours. We have three. We have three. Oh, you all want them? Keep going. Okay, we're going to have them made. Sorry, guys. We're going to... We're... All right, so we're going to go up. It's now $150. I've never been an auctioneer before, but that's a good idea. Oh, all right. We're going for... $200. All right, $500. Any other? Any other for $500? All right, so we have 250 and 500. We have one winner right there and 250 was right there. And we have one more. We have one more. And I think it goes to that gentleman right there. Yep, 202. We have three onesies. Preston, are you gonna wear that to next year's summit? I expect that to be look good on you. You're getting it. Thank you, everybody. What? That was 250. That was 500. And that was 100. Oh, we got another one? It, what is this, for 750? You go. Se All right, we got 750 million, you're beat. 750. A thousand. A thousand. Do I have 1250? I should do this for a job. Do I have 1250? I have 1250. Dude, step up. Do I have 1500? Come on, Derek. Hey, Going once, 1250. <laughs> what do you say? I'll wear that. Let's the rest of the For 1250? Right, I'm not good at this. I'm not good at this. All right, I am not an auctioneer. All right, we have we have a thousand and twelve fifty. Do we have anybody else for 1500 Okay, sold to the guy in the cowboy hat and Amelia Beatty. Wow. I have never seen a paddle raise like that. Did not expect the auction off of clothing items at the end. Um, thank you all for your incredible generosity tonight. I think we'll be able to give you a total in just a moment here. While we wait, a couple of housekeeping details. The credit card that you entered at registration will be automatically charged in 48 to 72 hours. If you would like to pay with an alternate form of payment, please visit the registration desk before you leave this evening. We are happy to accept checks, wire transfers, anything, any form of payment. Um, okay, Laura, are we good? Great, okay. Who wants to hear the total? Tonight, you raised $3,439,000. Of course, the, tonight's paddle raise represents just a portion of FAST's year-round fundraising. As Nora mentioned, our CAN fundraisers raised $959,749 this year. And our FAST Global Affiliates raised $983,348. Which brings the grand total for our 2022 fundraising to, someone's doing this math for me, 
five million five hundred and twenty eight hundred and forty six dollars. It's amazing. Now, to help us transition into the party part, and we obviously have a lot to celebrate, please help me welcome Fast Board Co-Vice Chair and Treasurer, Christy Dixon. Wow, what a night. That was just simply amazing. Um, thank you all. So every year, our summit and gala is in December, which for most people seems like the end of the year. But actually, for us, it's the beginning. This is how we jumpstart our year, giving us the information and inspiration needed to fuel our work in the coming months. And as we've seen, we are at a turning point. We have so much science to push forward, so much potential progress, just waiting for us to realize it. So thank you all, those in the room and those joining virtually, for participating in everything over the last few days. We hope you have a wonderful holiday season filled with joy and rest. We'll see you on the other side in January, ready to work on changing the world for our loved ones and everyone living with AS. Now let's start dancing. <laughs> <laughs>